and I hope all of you have an enjoyable time here. And to make sure that we all do have an enjoyable time, please switch off your cell phones at this point of time or put them on silent. And I have a couple, few announcements to make. Uh, tomorrow there is a banquet at 8 p.m. in the IMSC premises. You're all invited for the banquet. And tomorrow also at 11 a.m. there will be a, a group photo and that is right outside the library at tea time tomorrow, morning tea, 11, 11 a.m. tomorrow. And finally, uh, the TA forms will be available at 11 a.m. today at tea time. So please pick them up, fill them out and uh, return them to me uh, in, by the afternoon today. That's it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, well, Vijay has asked me to chair this session. So, welcome you all once more for this festival, Sundar Fest, right? So, our first speaker is Professor K. B. Sina from JNCSR. So, and his title is on the Koplenko Trace Formula and Beyond. Morning. It is a great pleasure to be here. In fact, when Vijay wrote to me saying that uh, such a thing is being planned, I think I must have been the, f he wrote back saying that I have the fastest reply of acceptance. I had obviously no, no doubt that I would be uh, present here on whichever day they plan to do it. So I'm once again very glad to be here. Uh, Sundar and I, our trajectories have intertwined in various times and places. Maybe we'll talk about it uh, tomorrow afternoon. Okay, so today I will, what I will talk about is something I've been working on with a student of mine, Arup Chattopadhyay, uh, for the last uh, year or so. And uh, so let me begin. Now my, I am technologically uh, somewhat challenged. All that uh, fancy thing that you see is due to Arup, not due to me. Uh, so let me uh, give the next slide, which is mostly to uh, motivate. This is mine, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a simple matter of matrices. So let A and B be two complex n by n mat symmetric matrices, and you define a, a, a sort of a map from the uh, interval 0, 1 to a family of symmetric matrices constructed as A plus S B. So the map, so look at the eigenvalues of the symmetric matrix and its dependence on the parameter S. Then this is a piecewise differentiable family of eigenvalues of A S. This is a well-known result. For example, you can look up Kato's book. Now if you look at the eigenvalue equation and differentiate it and do a little bit of manipulation, you will get that equation that you I should have said self-adjoint, yes. Hermitian. Hermitian, I should have said, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So the conclusion is uh, at first looks a little uh, surprising to me when I first looked at it. That was uh, maybe 10 years back when I looked, uh, saw this result for the first time. It was, I was a little surprised, but we, uh, that trace of the perturbation B, let's look at B as a perturbation of A, and look at the spectral family of ES is the spectral family of the family of self-adjoint operator uh, matrices AS. Uh, if you look at just the trace, this is obviously not uh, absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. But if you integrate over S, over the whole parameter space 0 to 1, then that becomes Yes, yes, sorry, yes. Phi, phi js is missing, yes. So you, you write down the eigenvalue equation and differentiate. Uh, so this, uh, the averaged or integrated uh, density is, is kind of, uh, is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure. And what is also surprising but true is that uh, this, uh, this observation remains true in infinite dimension as well. And that is the content of what is known as Crane's theorem, which goes under the last line. That is, if you look at function of perturbed operator A plus B, phi of A plus B, and subtract from it phi of A, take the trace thereof, the integral uh, that is given by the first derivative of the function phi, 
uh, integrated with respect to that density function uh, called Crane's shift, sh uh, shift function. Now this has been a uh, source of a lot of literature and uh, this formula and under what kind of conditions you can uh, prove such a thing. And many proofs have appeared uh, starting with Crane's original proof which goes back to 58 or 59 which uses function theory and then subsequently other people prove differently. In fact, okay, so this is uh, now starts the uh, little technically better presented, yeah. So now let H and H0 be two possibly unbounded. So this uh, th theorem is true for unbounded self adjoint operators as well, uh, such that the difference that is a perturbation is trace class that is traceable. Then Crane proved this theorem. Oh, sorry again. This A to B would not appear, okay, A B could be infinite, that A could be minus infinity, B could be plus infinity. Uh, there exists an L1 function that is a Crane shift function Z such that the difference, uh, trace of the difference is given by the integral with respect to the, uh, that function and the first derivative of uh, the function phi. Now you can think of it uh, as a kind of a mean value theorem in, under the trace. So you have phi of a0 and phi of a0 plus v, their difference is given on the average, on the left hand side average is given by trace, right hand side average is given by the integral with respect to this L1 function xi. Now Vicolescu in 1985 approached the formula trying to establish the, as I said many people proved this formula in many ways. And Vaikulescu's way was the following, that he first uh, tried to uh, cut it down to finite dimension. So you try to prove the formula for finite dimension and then by a limiting process you go to the final formula. Now the cutting down is specific to the operators involved. So you use some kind of adaptation of Weyl von Neumann theorem where uh, here in this case P is polynomial and A0 and A0 n are the truncation of the given operators to that finite dimensional subspace. Then the philosophy is that uh, you construct uh, the spectral shift function for the finite dimension and then take a limit appropriately to get the infinite dimensional case. Now I had a hand in it uh, to extend this to a Vicolescu type of uh, philosophy uh, to unbounded case long time back now so one can think of this as a mean value theorem under trace and then a natural question arises if one can have a mean value theorem under trace up to the next order so you want to uh, extend it to the next order and Koplyanko indeed asked such a question and provided a formula now his uh, theorem uh, his proof appeared in uh, one of the Russian journals and it is wrong which was detected uh, some decades after. In this case, the difference phi of h phi of minus phi of h naught is uh, no longer trace class because v is Hilbert Schmidt. V two means Hilbert Schmidt uh, class. So you have to subtract the f first derivative. So by capital D, I mean the fresher derivative of the function phi at h naught acting on v. Well. Uh, so, uh, and then find a trace, a trace formula for the above difference. So it is the next order in a sense. Then Koplyanko formula asserts that exists an unique L1 function such that you have the second order formula. So phi of h minus phi of h naught minus uh, the fresher derivative acting on V, this trace thereof is given by the second derivative of the function phi averaged over a certain L1 function. But he proved it for rational, phi, phi rational functions with poles of the real axis for that class of function. This function is called uh, Koplyanko's function. Now uh, this was proven long time back, uh, I think in the, uh, in the uh, 80s Koplyanko's formula was proven. But more recently 2007 Gestesi and Simon etc. et al. Uh, took it up and gave an alternative proof for the bounded case. That is when H and H naught are bounded. Now we try to prove the formula uh, by a method of finite dimensional approximation that we used for Crane's formula as well and extend the same for the unbounded case where H and H, uh, H naught is unbounded. 
but the difference remains in Hilbert Schmidt class and the functions are much larger class of functions for which this formula we managed to prove. Now uh, of course uh, this is an unending question you can uh, go on asking uh, how about the second order etc and uh, third order and so on. I will have something to say in the end on that. Uh, now I should also mention that uh, maybe it is there in the next uh, slide. No. Uh, uh, Dikema and uh, Skripka I think one of his students also uh, 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 attacked this problem but not the way we did not by finite dimensional approximation method but directly using some ideas from uh, free probability which of course you expect from Dikema but uh, uses uh, the inverse Cauchy transform techniques to prove these results. Uh, but the real challenge is to prove you see to get a measure is relatively easy uh, that is instead of eta lambda d lambda but some measure mu uh, d lambda is not that difficult but to show that that measure is absolutely continuous is the really hard part of the whole analysis and they managed to prove uh, uh, existence of measure for a uh, the, uh, for a different class of function phi and uh, but uh, in some cases they can uh, show that the measure, measure is absolutely continuous some cases they cannot so so let me quickly give a little bit of an idea of the how we go about proving it okay for bounded case it suffices to look at polynomials and since we are going to take uh, uh, up to uh, we are going to subtract the first order different uh, de deriv derivative so uh, you have to look at polynomials of degree greater than or equal to 2. So given that it is easy to compute these uh, okay so uh, you compute the fresh derivative and that is exactly this expression. Now as I had said in my introduction you introduce this uh, this uh, this map from the interval 0 1 to the family of self adjoint operators uh, given by h sub s and you try to find the derivative with respect to the parameter and that has very similar expression to the power to the fresher derivative because this is uh, actually the gato derivative in the direction of v whereas this is the fresher derivative so it is uh, not surprising that they looks uh, similar there exists a then the statement is that there exists a non-negative L1 function eta such that this formula holds. Now, so let me go back to the Crane's formula. Crane's formula, which is maybe called the zeroth order formula, this function xi or z has an interpretation coming from physics. That is where H naught is to be interpreted as Hamiltonian of a system H is a perturbation thereof and then Z or Xi function is interpreted as what is known as phase shift or sort of averaged out phase shift function which in scattering theory physicists do study. Now in this case Koplyenko case this is the Koplyenko formula in this uh, context. So let us look at the polynomial uh, expression this eta is a non-negative unique non-negative L1 function. The non-negativity is a little bit of a surprise uh, and uh, I do not think any interpretation exists that uh, at least I do not know of any interpretation of this function eta unlike the Crane's uh, function. So this is a statement of the theorem for bounded operator H0 V okay this is this, this part of the statement is finite dimension we do not need to do everything in infinite dimension. So finite dimension you have even a formula for eta expression for eta uh, precisely so. Uh, again you notice there is an averaging with respect to trace as well as the integral in ds just as Crane's case to remind you again oh, wrong arrow. Here. So try to imagine this formula for the Crane's function. So here is the integral ds, here is the trace, b has become v there, es is the spectral family of hs there, 
and this averaging is giving you the xi function and in the Koplyanko case it is uh, firstly it uh, here is the perturbation v in, in place of b but you look at the difference of the spectral family and then you average uh, or integrate over the parameter s and this gives the Koplyanko function so it is kind of instructive that you know as you go order by order then it changes the expression in a very systematic way uh, and the L1 norm of eta is precisely up to a factor the Hilbert Schmidt norm square of the perturbation okay so you, uh, roughly speaking I mean you just look at the difference of the powers and you do a little bit of manipulation and so you prove the okay that's elementary and similarly the uh, gato derivative is also elementary now you use the trace cyclicity of the trace and you have this uh, uh, formula that you establish that this Koplyanko difference let's call that Koplyanko difference uh, is can be cast in this form that uh, this gato derivative integral of the gato derivative over the path 0 1 minus the fresher derivative which is the value of the gato derivative at 0 uh, and then you do a little bit of uh, integration by parts so at this point you do integration by parts and remember we are in finite dimension for this part of the calculation so uh, uh, the boundary term vanishes because you have a difference uh, and uh, you get the formula that you are looking for so this uh, just explains that the boundary terms vanishes and we get the formula that we are looking for where the Koplyanko function has the form that I had written earlier. Uniqueness of eta follows from the uniqueness of a probability density uh, in a supported in a finite dimensional uh, finite interval with a given sequence of moments uh, because you take all the polynomials and that will give you the moment equation and all the moments must uh, be the same and that uh, gives you the given sequence of moments uh, and gives you the uniqueness now positivity we use the idea going back uh, quite some decades due to birman solomiak the uh, russian uh, uh, group so what do you do we approximate the spectral uh, family by a smoothed out spectral family which is continuous from the right and uh, uh, so the which approximates the spectral family which is continuous from the right and then you look at the difference of this approximate spectral family for h naught and h naught plus uh, the perturbation and you get this uh, simple formula okay uh, so here is the difference of the function divided by this argument difference and you have this measure now what kind of an object is this this is a uh, measure in the square a b to cross a b and uh, v is Hilbert Schmidt okay so we are uh, though we are in uh, I mean th for this you think of it you are in infinite dimension so v is Hilbert Schmidt so think of this as a measure on the plane and you can uh, prove that this is in the, indeed a bona fide measure in the plane with finite variation and with total variation less than equal to uh, the uh, well this is wrong it should be the Hilbert Schmidt norm of uh, V that should be uh, the total variation of this measure on the square so phi so this is the measure we have just given it a name and this uh, therefore I hit it with V on the left hand side and uh, take a trace then I get this quadratic form of uh, so this gives a numerical uh, measure of finite variation and then this uh, uh, is non-negative because this is non-negative non and this is negative because it is a decreasing function so the difference quotient is negative and here there is a minus sign thereby proving this uh, positivity of this uh, expression for approximate uh, spectral families well this is sins not science uh, so therefore uh, since these converge strongly to the spectral families respectively as epsilon goes to zero epsilon is the approximation parameter and the spectral family is right continuous in our definition uh, it follows that uh, 
the object of our interest E is non-negative. Therefore, eta is non-negative because eta is an integral of those expressions uh, that this it is an integral over S of this expression. And uh, the total L1 uh, uh, integral of eta, L1 norm of eta is uh, since eta is non-negative uh, can be easily evaluated by taking a square of the uh, polynomial as lambda square and you evaluate it, it gives you exactly what has been mentioned before. So total uh, L1 norm is related to the Hilbert Schmidt norm of now the approximation part. How do we uh, come from the infinite dimension to finite dimension? And that is an adaptation of Weil von Neumann. So, so the statement is, uh, this I won't prove. Uh, so A is a given self-adjoint operator in an, uh, this is infinite dimensional Hilbert space now. Let Fj be a set of normalized vectors in H and epsilon is a given positive number. This is a finite family, J from 1 to L. Then for uh, A is fixed, Fj's are fixed and epsilon is fixed. For these three fixed things, I, there exists a finite rank projection P such that 1 minus P Fj norm less than epsilon and furthermore uh, that is P perp A P is Hilbert Schmidt and Hilbert Schmidt norm can be made less than this epsilon. I mean that's how the P has been chosen. And furthermore the exponential uh, uh, instead of I think this is about to die uh, uh, is also can be estimated uh, similarly uniformly in T for T in a compact. So this I won't prove. Uh, essentially adapting Weil von Neumann's proof, uh, von Neumann proof, von Neumann's proof of Weil's uh, uh, theorem. So now, so now we go back to our problem, H and H not be two given self-adjoint operators such that the difference is Hilbert Schmidt in infinite dimension. That given, so what we do is essentially look at the canonical uh, form of V and then chop it off at L suitably such that L is chosen by uh, this given epsilon L is chosen so that the truncation is within epsilon distance in the Hilbert Schmidt norm. So, uh, so we reformulate by uh, in, in, uh, that there is a sequence of Pn such that we have these things converging to 0, but one should be cautious that P, it does not mean that Pn converges to identity as strongly to identity. Okay. Pn is a sequence which looks like going to identity but not on arbitrary things. It is, only, it is manufactured for the given operator H0 and for the given, uh, yeah, for the given operator H0 and V. Okay. okay, now this I will skip. So what you do is that Okay, so this is just the statement of the final theorem. So let me give uh, just an idea. So first is that the Weil von Neumann type of truncation which I described gives me a Pn such that this trace can be computed by computing the truncated trace and taking limit thereafter. For truncated trace is a finite dimensional problem. So I know there exists a sequence eta n of non-negative L1 functions such that for this the formula holds. And in fact, we have an explicit expression as I had written earlier. But these are all finite dimensional truncation of the original operator. So what we are left with is to show that eta n forms an L1 Cauchy sequence. But you can, uh, to prove it directly is almost impossible. So what you prove is looking at it in, in the dual. So you take an arbitrary function f in a, a bounded function over the interval this is the bounded case and look at uh, these integrals and want to show this goes to 0 uniformly in the L infinity norm of f. Okay. That is what you do, it is a bit of a calculation but it, it works. Now when you want to go to the unbounded operator, if h and h naught are not bounded that means your interval is becomes infinite. 
uh, then you will have to uh, switch over to the uh, to the this uh, the the unitary group instead of polynomials uh, of the of the operators involved and exactly similar kind of uh, thing can be done for uh, for uh, uh, exponentials uh, of unbounded uh, operators h naught and h the philosophy is identical and uh, you have to just carry through the computations and you indeed get that similar kind of proof except only thing you have to pay attention is that when doing this proof f is l infinity and what we do is that uh, the integration by parts that we did has to be undone that means you have to look at the integral of f when f is over a bounded interval it is a bounded function over a bounded interval the integral of f is also bounded but when it is a, a integral of a bounded function over an infinite interval the integral ceases to be bounded so that creates a little bit of a problem but can be handled so the theorem is the final theorem is h and h not are two self urgent operator in infinite dimension notice they are not necessarily bounded i do not say they are bounded uh, such that the difference is hilbert schmidt and let's say phi is in uh, schwarz class then this difference Koplyenko difference, let's call that, is Hilbert is trace class. Furthermore, the trace is given by the Koplyenko formula, where eta is a unique non-negative L1 function with that L1 uh, value. Now, you do not anymore have an expression for eta. All you know, there exists an unique L1 function. And furthermore, as a remark, you can say that this formula can be extended. You don't nearly need a Schwarz class function. Any function which can be given this form where nu is a is a complex measure and it can have a linear term additionally uh, given uh, so that it is kind of a transform of a certain any any complex measure then for such class of phi is also you have uh, such a formula only problem is the left hand side may not be interpretable as an operator so that is a word of caution because this this uh, integral if you think for a minute is essentially effectively quadratic if it is quadratic in lambda then the operators will be quadratic h square and h naught square here so even if v is bounded it is hilbert schmidt in fact so the domains of h naught and h naught and h will be the same but domain of h naught square and h square can be a little complicated so domain of phi of h and phi of h naught may not have enough good intersection so as whenever the left hand side is defined as an operator then this formula holds that should be the statement for the unbounded case now okay so i am doing pretty well now back to my my technology this is the part beyond so what one can do beyond what i have said so far one can do the following go to the next order as i had said uh, no names are associated with this formula so this is for the bounded case so again i am well i'm sorry that i'm changing notations this is uh, for the bounded case a is a bounded self adjoint operator in infinite dimensional hilbert space a v is a uh, now notice the schatten class is changing with each order the schatten class uh, changes by one this is uh, b3 the third certain class and self adjoint then there exists a bounded measurable function and the class of the function is also changing such that you have uh, i think this is dead uh, you have this formula where you have the uh, notice i have subtracted the second derivative fresh air, second fresh derivative act uh, uh, as a quadratic uh, bilinear form on v v okay so that's that's the second order uh, derivative then this is a polynomial function this is the th third derivative here and you have this function kappa and the integral of kappa kappa is not any more uh, non negative i mean we can't uh, there is no definite sign to it unlike the koplyenko case and this will be uh, up to a factor uh, trace of uh, the, the uh, v cube 
Uh, this step here is uh, are the same as Koplyenko formula, but much more complicated. The hardest part is to derive the formula in finite dimension. Such an object in finite dimension, you can compute everything, but how to put it in the form that shows in the right hand side is a, is a bit of a challenge. And we have only re very recently been able to find some kind of a, an expression which is given there. Now I have to explain what are these V1, e, e tau, well, tau, e tau and uh, hs are the same, the para except that you notice here there is a double integral now with respect to the parameter. It is an iterated integral un in, the, in the lower part of the simplex. Uh, integral 0 to s and integral d s 0 to 1. So, you are in the square, you are integrating in the lower part of the square below the diagonal. So, what is v 1 and v 2? Okay. So, uh, with respect to the Hilbert Schmidt inner product in the space of matrices M and C, uh, the canonical silk, uh, decomposition of v you take as v 1 direct sum v 2 or v 1 tau direct sum v 2 tau with respect to the parameter uh, tau. Uh, so, when tau is 0 you we call it v 1 v 2. So, v 1 is coming from the commutant of A. A is the given operator we start with and v is the perturbation. And v 2 is in the range of this uh, commutator, commutator that is v 2 can be written as A commutator y for some y. Uh, the, and similarly, v1 tau is the, just the commutant of a tau and v2 tau can be written as a commutator of a tau with some y. So, going back to the formula, so, so it is those v1, v2, etc., they appear in this, uh, in this expression. So, there are, uh, so there is one which is that just the spectral family appears and one which is the integral of the spectral family appears. So, that is, uh, so the, the, uh, we have not yet completed this program uh, for this part that is we have not yet ach achieved the uh, limiting process that is still to be done. Now, next thing that one can do and this is a bigger challenge that is more than one variable. So, here von Neumann uh, Weil theorem which uh, we had used to truncate the problem to finite dimension, uh, we look at uh, the Berg's uh, modification of von Neumann Weil and we modify it uh, as follows. So, this is a theorem we have been able to prove for n tuples commuting n tuples. So, a 1 into a n, b n commuting self adjoint operators in infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Then there exists now in this case there is a sequence of p n of finite rank projections increasing to identity. So, this is really the strong converging uh, sequence of projections now such that the commutator of each of them with this uh, projection in the p norm goes to 0 as n goes to infinity for each j, but the problem is the the p the the certain class certain norm has to be greater than the number n. So, for example, if I have had 2 which is the next thing that one would like to uh, work with the uh, it becomes greater than 2 it just misses 2 p greater than 2 and that uh, does give rise to certain uh, difficulties. Uh, now, and such things this kind of expression 1 minus p n a g p n that is p n perp a p n occurs uh, uh, frequently in all the calculations that have preceded that in the reduction of the problem to finite dimension. And here also th this and this are the same essentially same. Therefore, for example, in finite dimension uh, uh, well I mean we can prove this in infinite dimension. So, take two functions phi j let us say in Schwartz class over the plane R 2 and take two tuples uh, H and H naught. So, H 0 1, H 0 2 they commute, H 1, H 2 they commute, so two commuting pair of self adjoint operators and you would look at phi 1 of H that is tuple and subtract 
from it phi 1 of h naught tuple and similarly take another function phi 2 of h minus phi 2 of h naught tuple. This product is in uh, B1 is stress class uh, I have said somewhere Vj this is wrong this should be V4 uh, it is not B2 because I, my n is equal to 2. So according to the previous theorem P should be greater than 2. So I, I have written it wrongly here it should be B4. So in particular I can choose it to be B4 then this product oh, well this is dead. So this product uh, is going to be in B1 and uh, the, so at least the, uh, we are able to prove that there is a finite dimensional truncation of this problem provided we take a product of differences not one difference like the previous uh, single variable uh, theorems. So now that this is trace class one can look at the trace of this product and try to see how the formula looks like and here geometry is expected to play a role because you are no more in one dimension. So question is uh, we are not yet uh, able to derive a formula of uh, geometric significance and uh, we are looking for we have a formula but that formula does not have obviously any geometric uh, uh, feature that we can uh, find. So, so this is where we are and I will stop here and thank you for listening. And happy birthday, Sundar. Four times we have a lot of time. He's asking for reference. Okay, sorry, the references are here. Yeah. Well, these are not all the references, just some selective references. Any question? Berg, B E R G. No, his statement was uh, slightly different. No, it is for n tuples. For n tuples, n tuples of uh, for if it is tuple, then it is a normal operator. Okay, statement. Yeah, but it can be extended to n commuting tuples uh, without too much effort. But his statement was different. His statement was that if you are given n tuple of commuting uh, self adjoints then you can find a diagonal operator that is uh, you know a diagonal operator such that the difference is uh, in operator norm is compact and the operator norm can be made arbitrarily small less than epsilon given epsilon here we are looking at the satin class also we are a little bit uh, more uh, finer that is all. But, but the, the so far we are not able to bring it down below n, I mean it has to be greater than n. Our estimates are not uh, strong enough for some, I do not know, we are not able to improve it. I have one thing, what, uh, you have some connection with these Hans inequalities and this thing. Which inequality? Hans inequalities. And I, I am not that, that knowledgeable about the Hans inequality I must admit. Uh, but I don't see any more any connection immediately. It I would I would be expecting a, for the two variable for example I would be expecting a formula which gives me on the right hand side some kind of a Stokes expression, Stokes integral, with respect to the two function phi one and phi two. So you'll have a d phi one wedge d phi two with some function of two variables. That this will be now a function of two variable instead of a function of one variable but I cannot yet cast it in the Stokes form. Mm.